to go. Good evening, everybody. I'm Amy Cohen. I'm chair of the Rhode Island chapter of the RISD Alumni Club, and I'm very excited to be here tonight with you. I just want to do a few housekeeping announcements. Number one, this webinar with Katie Westcott is being recorded, so note that. Additionally, although the chat feature is not working for us tonight because it's a webinar, you can put your questions in the Q&A feature, which I'll be monitoring this evening, and <clears throat> with hope we'll have some time to address some of your questions to Katie. Um, I wanted to greet you all. This is being hosted by the Rhode Island Alumni Club, and among many other things, we've kept going during Zoom with programs such as this. We're pretty close to having some in-person meetings, and I think there's going to be a lot of exciting programming to come. And I can tell you myself that it's been very gratifying to be a volunteer with this department, and I encourage you all to find ways of participating by going on the website during uh, whatever time you are interested in volunteering. There's plenty of programming all over globally, and you can look for your own local alumni club on the alumni portal of the RISD website. But back to tonight, Katie Westcott, after graduating from RISD in, 20, in 2002 with a degree in jewelry and metalsmithing, Katie worked for a goldsmith in NYC in Manhattan before moving back to Rhode Island to design costume jewelry. A workshop in laser cutting led her to button making, the intersection of jewelry and fiber arts, and this is how Katrinkles, her company, began. We're excited this evening to welcome Katie Westcott. Thanks, Amy. Um, as you said, I went to RISD for jewelry and when I graduated, um, I realized that I basically didn't want to make jewelry anymore after you know doing that as my day job. So I started knitting and knitting and crocheting led me into this whole world of all these things you could do with knitting. Um, and as you said, buttons are really the intersection of of jewelry and knitting. So when I took that laser cutting workshop at AS220, um, I started making buttons instead of jewelry, which is what I thought I would be making. And that led me into making knitting needle gauges. And um, eventually I started making like pom-pom makers and tassel makers and we make stitch markers and all this stuff. So we're manufacturing everything in Providence in the Union Paper Building. And, um, well, Katie, tell people where that building is. So it's kind of near the main post office on Admiral Street. It's at like Admiral Street and Whipple Street. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an Italianate textile mill from I think the late 17 and early 1800s. And it's really beautiful inside. It has all the original floors and we actually have wooden ceilings too. And they take really nice care of it. Um, and we're not the only manufacturer in here. They're also manufacturing food packaging um, that they're called admiral packaging mm -hmm. so it's really cool to be in another in a building where there are other people manufacturing in addition to lots of other like you know more um like businesses where people wear suits whatever you whatever you call those <laughs> the, the suit, um, you're also you're also intersecting with the history of providence i mean you have the the history in costume jewelry that you touched upon and in and mill work um so you're kind of a, a historic and contemporary reference point there. Yeah, it's cool because my family has a really long history of manufacturing and um, and jewelry making in Rhode Island and also in Europe. So it's kind of neat to be continuing on with that in, in what I'm currently doing. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people will say that there's no manufacturing left in this country and there's no jewelry manufacturing in this country, but that's not true. <laughs> so the thing that can be difficult sometimes is finding materials that are made in this country so that, you know, so that all the components are made here. But um, but yeah, we're making everything here. I'm designing everything and I have a team of, um, we're currently a team of nine people, but I have someone else starting next week. So we'll be a team of 10. And I'm, I feel thankful to say that we have been able to operate throughout the whole pandemic because I have 2,100 square feet. So there's been enough space for everyone to have their own area and you know be comfortable and distant from everyone else. When the pandemic first started, I had everyone um, stagger their schedules so that there would be less people in here at a time. But it's, you know, now we're all, we had to rearrange basically to give everyone enough space, but we're all back. 
most of the time. So. When did Katrinkle's launch? When was it first opened? Um, so it officially launched in probably 2012. I started the business as a hobby. So I'm not exactly sure at the beginning, you know, what I did when, but um, when I, when I left my part-time job, when I left my full-time job to work part-time and then also focus on Katrinkles, I think that was 2015. No, I have a timeline because I'm not good at dates. Um, that was 2013. And so then my first, so 2015 is when I started working on Katrinkles full-time. Um, and then I started getting a lot better at keeping records. It's when I first started buying my own machines rather than renting time at the makerspace where I was doing it originally. So you're completely self-contained, independent shop. Yep. So we make everything here. I get my wood custom milled here in Rhode Island um, and we laser cut everything here. Everything gets assembled here and sanded here and I design it here. Um, something that was really neat during the pandemic was that I launched a new product that we pretty much designed completely remotely. Um, I did the design for the product and then we sourced the packaging remotely um, and it was sampled. You know, I, I sent the artwork and it was sampled here while I was working at home and um, Sarah assembled them. She glued them all on her dining room table. So it was kind of neat, but I'll show you that product. It's a darning loom. So it's a couple pieces. This is a little heddle that goes into it and then you use it to mend your socks. So using the darning loom, you kind of like warp it over the hole in your sock and then it allows you to create a patch. And then you end up oh, beautiful patches mm -hmm. of, in your socks, which I had a lot of holes in my socks, but my husband had a ridiculous amount of holes in his socks. So it's been really fun to create all these different patches in bright colors and all of our all of our socks. That one's a heart. And so, I can't think of better timing for having <clears throat> created this invention. Your, your intuition was impeccable because not only does it um, uh, speak to people who are homebound due to COVID, but it, uh, it interfaces with the repair movement, the idea of minimalism and making do with what we have and, and reuse. Uh, it's just a beautiful intersection of many timely themes. When you first yeah. had this idea for the new product, this new item, was it because it was it inspired by the times we're living in or is it just your own personal issues? Your own No, I, I decided that because of the pandemic, it would be a good time to encourage people to be mending. I think in general, there's a movement of mending going on. And I thought that we could make an easier way for people to be doing it. Um, and it actually, I think in general, over the past year, people we're knitting more and making things more, but also mending things more. So it worked out really well. And um, it kept us really busy during a time where a lot of businesses weren't doing well. So yeah. I feel really thankful for that. And it ended up being so popular that I've designed a bigger one. So this is, this is the like sweater size, sweater or blanket size one in action on a, a big hole in a sweater. So mm -hmm. that one I'm releasing in the next couple of weeks but I'll show you the two side by side. Well, actually here are their boxes. We get our boxes made in Rhode Island too. They're made in Johnston. Could you give a shout out to the company? <clears throat> They're called a and &H, H Manufacturing. And Manufacturing. And the um, I do have two questions that have just come in. I, I don't mean to interrupt your presentation, but these are relevant. Um, sure. one, one is the question, what kind of laser cutting machines do you use? Um, so my first machine was a Chinese made laser because it was what I could afford. I took out a loan to buy that one um, and it paid for itself pretty quickly. And I ended up being able to buy a second one the next year. So I have three of that machine, um, but the Chinese made lasers are really um, temperamental. So a couple of years ago, I, I bought my first epilogue laser and now I have two epilogues and three Chinese made machines. Beautiful. Interesting. Um, another uh, shout out that I just want to make sure people heard is that your this direction was really inspired by a pretty significant course that you took at AS220. And mm -hmm. we'll 
give them a shout out for keeping that space going. And since they have a program and a space with a laser cutter, we want to support them in any way we can. So here's yeah. a shout out to AS220 and gratitude that that uh, Katie found her way there uh, and that you it's guys- It's really amazing all the resources that we have available to us at AS220. They have um, CAD and shop bots and like, 3D printers and the laser cutter and they have recording studios and printmaking. It's really amazing all the stuff that's going on there. So there's our public service announcement and <laughs> incredible gratitude, incredible gratitude that you intersected with them. A great, re another great resource just as you are uh, in Providence. So Thank I didn't interrupt your, but I couldn't resist. No, that, that's great. Um, I guess I'll give you a tour of my studio. Great. So I'm currently in my office, which I feel so thankful to have my own office right now because I didn't always, but this is where I've been sitting. Um, and so I'm going to give you, unfortunately, I'm here by myself, so you have to watch me move. But um, so this is my whole studio. Oh well, actually, I guess I should back up so you can see this cool arch. This, um, this complex, I think, is made up of 13 buildings. So this arch is actually the break between one building and another. Mm. But so this is the whole studio and I guess I will, I will start over here at the machines cause they're kind of the beginning. They're the first step after designing. So those are the two epilogue machines. Can you still hear me out here? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Those are the two epilogues and then behind them are the three um, Chinese made machines, the temperamental machines. Mm -hmm. um, and there's nothing cutting right now cause I'm here by myself, but the epilogues are great because they're so much bigger. This is my newest one. This one's really cool because it has a camera in it. So you can on your screen on the, on the computer actually watch what's cutting inside. So everything starts out here and cuts here. Mm -hmm. um, and then it moves through the rest of our process. So let me think, what's the next part? So really the next part is sanding, which happens down that hall. And I'm gonna show you that last, but things get assembled over here. The scrap that we end up with is kind of cool. Like this oh. is some cedar, some cedar hearts. <laughs> Love that. Beautiful. Um, and then this is where things get assembled. So right now it looks like there are some stitch markers getting assembled over here, getting put into our packaging, which um, I designed this packaging to kind of look like a little envelope around the stitch markers. So, and stitch markers, if you're not a knitter, um, the way they get used is it's like a little piece of jewelry that you put into your knitting to remind you that you need to do something when you get there. So it's the beginning of the row or you need to add a stitch or subtract a stitch or something like that. So interesting that you just used the word jewelry, jewelry for knitting. Because <laughs> you, talked about, you didn't really want to be making traditional jewelry, but you're still making jewelry as a good RISD along mm -hmm. that kind of intersection of all of your talents and interests in a beautiful way. The idea of knit, knitting wearing jewelry. Right. Yeah. It's funny because I really do love making jewelry, but there's just so much jewelry and there was a lot of competition in the jewelry world to, you know, get your name out there and have people even notice what you're making because there's so much of it. So there's not a lot of people making knitting supplies and, and accessories. So it just ended up that the jewelry I made never really went anywhere, but the buttons and the knitting needle gauges and stuff were super popular. So that ended up being the direction that I went into, but I still really love jewelry. <laughs> but yeah, there, there definitely are similarities and we go about making things in a very like jewelry type way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, this is another assembly station. She's also, we sell a lot of stitch markers. So it looks like Michelle is also working on making stitch markers over here. These are just parts that, um, that she's working on. And I guess I should also say that um, I have over 500 stockists all over the world. So these bins are all extra stock from wholesale orders. So a big part of what my business is, is making basically custom tools for people. So this is a yarn shop in um, Portland, Oregon, I guess. And she, um, we make them these custom tools that have their logo on it. So that's the majority of what we do is um, private label branded stuff. So I sell things under the Katrinkles brand. I sell things to stores that are the Katrinkles products. And then I also do custom branded stuff for yarn shops or designers or catalogs. Um, 
all sorts of, and, you know, sometimes random things for weddings or stuff like that too. Mm -hmm. So you've really uh, created an incredible community. Uh, there's a, there is a, I know there's a communal aspect to knitters and, and people who work with fibers. There's a strong sense of community in that world. You have really been be, provided a service to these people. Yeah, it's been, it's really neat. I never really expected that this would be what I did, but if you, if you're a knitter or a crocheter, you've probably heard of Katrinkles there. Are, and so it's kind of funny because um, my boyfriend likes to Sorry, my husband. <laughs> we just got married, so I keep doing that. Um, he likes to say that I'm famous among a very small group of people, but actually there's a lot of knitters. It's just a very specific group of people. So <laughs> it's kind of funny, but I've actually been in restaurants before and had people come up to me because they recognize me from my Instagram and want to talk about Katrinkles and want to talk about knitting, which is really funny. <laughs> it really is a passion. Yeah. Um, this little sitting area is actually my grandparents' couch from the 60s. Oh. Oh. So I need to get it reupholstered, but um, I really love it. <laughs> um, and then this is a little backwards in the order of things, but this is my shipping area. So um, this is all inventory like here and back there. And I try to make it so that you can see everything at all times because it makes it easier to ship stuff. But this is where everything goes out. There's some um, wholesale orders here sitting like part way done for some shops. And actually these are all wholesale orders too, waiting to go. So we currently have like a two to three week production time because we make, although the custom stuff is all made to order, but we try to have stock of everything that is like a normal stock item. Although I'm still trying to catch up from Christmas this year because we've been really busy. Um, but this is all regular stock so these are these are some knitting needle gauges and some wraps per inch tools this tool you wrap your yarn around in this slot and it tells you what weight the yarn is mm -hmm. um, and then this is my most popular line of tools these I call them mini tools and we make 30 different ones and they're just all different like miniature size knitting needle gauges or um, my most popular one is this one which is called Kitchener, which is a, a way of live grafting hmm. um, stitches from basically from two different needles. Like um, you could do it under the arm of a sleeve or at the toe of a sock. Um, and then these are all buttons. So ironically, because it's the thing that I started doing, buttons are actually not my most popular item, but, hmm. um, but we do still make a lot of styles of them. And then these are all Christmas ornaments that you can stitch into with embroidery floss. Hmm. I don't think I have an example of one stitched right here, but those are really popular in the, um, at certain times of year, as you can imagine. <laughs> I would imagine. Uh, this one, is of a, your, one of your fans uh, has just weighed in in the Q&A. You have a fan who says, knitters love Katrinkles. <laughs> oh, you, thank you. Your fan club <laughs> out there is, is uh, dialing in. And a business question for you curious if you have a bookkeeper or do you do your own bookkeeping? So I, I did my own bookkeeping initially. Um, and I realized this is a, a real luxury when you, when you get a little further along in a business, but it's, it feels really amazing to be able to take the things you're not good at and pass them on to someone who is good at them. So I had a bookkeeper who would come in at first quarterly, and then she started coming in every month. And then she would do it monthly. And I recently switched to a full-on accountant who does weekly accounting for me. So um, I, I wish I had done it earlier. It definitely, I think, saves money in the long run to have someone who knows what they're doing, take care of money stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but just in general, for all sorts of business things, like I've been really trying to make my own life easier by letting people um, basically hiring to my faults, you know, letting people who are good at things do the things they're good at instead of me beating myself up over not being good at numbers. <laughs> and well, that way I can focus on designing instead, you know. Exactly. It's a collaborative uh, affair. It's certainly business like theater, you know. Mm -hmm. You can be the ringmaster and the creative uh, force behind it, but certainly it's reasonable to collaborate with people. Yeah, I really was not prepared. Um, I don't have a business degree. You know, I always like to joke, like I went to art school, like I, I don't know how to do this, but I'm doing it. Like I have a 
I have a successful business. So, um, I'm not exactly sure how that happened, but it just, you know, from making mistakes, I've learned from what I'm doing and, um, it's, it's really great to be able to have a bookkeeper. <laughs> so I recommend it. Um, this area is a new area that we just set up for someone who now does quality control. So that's also an amazing thing to have her basically examine everything before it goes out and make sure that it's completely perfect. Um, and then this is where my production manager sits. And that is another thing that is kind of a luxury because she is controlling everything that goes on on the floor in here, which has allowed you know me to spend time doing the things that I'm actually good at, like designing stuff and marketing and those kinds of things. Um, this is my sink area. And so every piece basically gets washed um, and that removes the residue from laser cutting or it removes any sawdust from sanding. And then you can see, and probably hear, these tumblers running, those are sanding small parts. They're either sanding or small um, or washing small parts. So we used to scrub every single piece individually and now the tumblers just wash them for us, which is a great time saver. Um, and then everything gets dried on this. It's actually a sheet pan rack from a restaurant, but um, for us, it's our drying rack. So these are actually darning loom tops before, they're, before they get glued. Um, and then there's some Kitchener mini tools, which I was just showing you and some custom stuff. These are lucets for someone named Laura Nel Nelkin. These are actually not sanded yet, but that is the next thing I'm gonna show you is the sanding room. So everything goes in here to get sanded. Um, and then this is also my wood stash. The top is cedar and then there's some birch and this is cherry, which is what most things are made out of. Um, these are all pieces. They're just waiting. These are sock blockers. We make adjustable sock blockers. So it's a whole bunch of different pieces that you pin together with these, um, these little screw parts that, that make a sock shape. And the, what you use that for is um, after you knit a sock, you you stretch it over these blockers and it makes it like the perfect sock shape, basically. Um, so we use this grinder to either grind the edges of things or we also have what, um, it's actually my flex shaft from jewelry. Um, although everyone here calls it a hand sander, which I think is kind of funny, but it, it's just different because they didn't go to school for jewelry. <laughs> um, and then some parts we've started using recently, this kind of, um, I forget what this kind of sander is called, but these are also sock, these are baby sock pop blocker parts. They're <laughs> so much fun here. I know, like the little toe and the heel. Oh man, oh, man. they're really <laughs> cute. So we have a question about the sanding um, and sure. the washing. When you're washing these pieces that you're talking about, everyone's asking about the, uh, the wood. Um, when you are washing them, is it water? And why don't the pieces warp from being wet? Um, the so it is just water I don't use any kind of detergent um at, when I first started it I was using soap I was just using dish soap but I found that it dried the wood out so I stopped doing that um a long time ago and it doesn't really warp I think that if the piece is wet evenly and then it dries evenly that it it doesn't um I'll I'll bring you back to the drying rack so that I can show you but we've realized that if you If you dry the pieces on a, on a towel like this, that it helps it to dry evenly. And mm -hmm. also having, they're more likely to warp, but I think it's just that the pieces are, are small enough. Like this is a Minnesota knitting needle gauge. It's small enough that it doesn't, it doesn't need to warp, but also I'm using the grain in a direction that is basically um, like, it's, it's optimized to make it not warp because the grain is going the long direction. Does that make sense? Yep, it does. Because it will I, warp um, the, if it's going the other way. I, I love the, um, the fact that you're, you're making these utilitarian objects so beautiful. That tradition of beautiful tools has always, has always attracted me. So that there, these things that you're making are in the service of people making functional clothing, socks, sweaters, and so forth, making 
art out of your art, which I, I find just a lovely, a lovely development in your career. Thank you. Yeah, I've always been a person who loves, um, I don't want to say unnecessary tools, but like I love kitchen gadgets and just any sort of tool that you don't necessarily need to do a task, but that makes it easier because you have it. Mm-hmm. That's something that I've always been interested in. And it's also basically what I've built my business on. So, And also the branding. I mean, a Minnesota, you know, the fact that these are, uh, have the various brands and, and decorative aspect makes them even more special. Yeah, it's it's been really fun to have a, a knitting needle gauge for every state. So I started with a Rhode Island needle gauge because I was doing a Rhode Island fiber festival. And then just people from other states were like, when are you going to have Connecticut? And when are you going to have? Um, it's interesting because New Hampshire and Min- Michigan are the two most popular ones. So people in Michigan and New Hampshire really love their states. But um, but I sell them to yarn shops all over the country. So it's a little um, sociological study of uh, which yeah. states are really proud of this, their statehood and of being knitters. There's kind yeah. of- um, the least popular one is, well, I don't know if it's the least popular one, but the last one I designed because I was kind of waiting for people to ask for them until I designed them. And the last one was New Mexico, just yeah. nobody, nobody had asked for it. So I didn't have it for a really long time. <laughs> That's really fun. Um, and then this room, I always tell people, this is my favorite room because this is the storage room. So when I first started the business, it was in my loft apartment and this was all the, I mean, it wasn't at the scale, but this was all the stuff that was like hidden under my bed and jammed into closets, you know, like things that I bring to shows and all sorts of random things that I didn't want to look at all the time. So the great thing about having a storage room is that I don't have to look at them all the time. So that is my, that's my full tour. Everybody needs a storage room in life. especially. <laughs> yeah. But the, the thing about living in a loft apartment is that you have no storage at all and it's really exciting to have everything be out and visible all the time but then everything is really out and visible all the time so it's great to have a division of space in here you seem so well suited to be a businesswoman i feel that there must be some genetic code when you talk (laughs) about your your familial history as being in the industry there must be a genetic reason but it's also your skill set is really exceptional and your courage uh, and creativity to be inventive when well, you were doing one thing at RISD and then you you took those skills and not even it doesn't sound like any trepidation just segued into something else and I'm fascinated to know if you can reference back to your education at, at the school if there was a teacher or a course or a philosophy that enabled you to do that beyond the the genetic you know the inherited businesswoman skill how do you um, It's funny, when I was at RISD, uh, I was in the jewelry department, which was really small, but we were actually one of the biggest classes that had ever been in jewelry. I think we were 12 people, um, which was, everyone kept telling us what a big class we were, but, (laughs) um, but I was really interested in like having a lot of attention in general. That's why I wanted to be part of a small department. I didn't really want to be in the industrial design department because I felt like it was going to be so, um, so many other students and I wasn't going to get as much attention from my professors. Um, But it's interesting because I feel like what I do is kind of more industrial design or more graphic design. And those were the two other things I considered majoring in. So ironically, I think those are actually what I'm doing. But um, a class that really, I think I got a lot out of was with Lewis Muller. He, um, He ran a, I was always really interested in just marketing and selling things in general. And he had a class where you were supposed to design a product and design the packaging and then work on selling it. Um, And the product I designed was actually wedding bands. And I never, I I never sold my own wedding bands, but, um, but it really got me thinking about like creating a sellable product. So I think also just learning from education, I mean, learning from employment, basically. Um, I think the reason I got my first job as a goldsmith in New York was because I went to RISD because everyone who worked there went to RISD. Um, And when I worked there, it was right after September 11th. So Um, there was, there was not a lot of demand for jewelry at that point. So instead of working as a goldsmith, I spent a lot of my time working um, on managing the wholesale accounts, which is, is basically what led me into what I'm doing right now. That's how I got the experience wholesaling. Um, And then once I decided to move back to Rhode Island and work in the costume jewelry industry, um, there, what I was doing was designing private label 
jewelry to sell to, you know, mall stores basically, and taking people's ideas and turning them into something to sell them, but through design. So that's kind of the other half of what I do. So I'm, you know, taking for my retail customers and also for my wholesale customers, like trying to create marketable things for them. So I think that started with my RISD education, but also it was embellished upon through all the places that I've worked. So in a way, what you, the last comment, you, the comments you were making lead me to feel that you are mentoring these people because you're in a way guiding them through br branding and making suggestions such as you mentioned uh, to, to become people who can advocate and market and uh, use branding at, through your techniques to further their mission. Um, which, you know, I mean, part of the education that we all had at RISD was having to learn how to survive some pretty rigorous crits. So, you know, it's like Shark Tank all the time, right? <laughs> yeah, and, basically. You, know, it, you have to advocate, you have to be able to communicate. And those skills, I felt, were really a very important part of my, my RISD education. And I can see that for you as well. And that you did not become too departmentalized or compartmentalized that you were able to see that you there's a graphic designer in you there's somebody who does marketing in you and you brought those to bear so quickly after graduating which is really inspiring i'm sure to people who are who are watching um yeah something that i think is really important in business is to diversify so mm -hmm. you know not using only one type of wood not using only one material um not selling all your stuff through one venue. Like I have three different websites and I do wholesale and I do retail and I'll sell in person sometimes. And so having all sorts of different ways of diversifying, I think make sure that one of those is always hopefully going to work. So, you know, I think that really set me up for in the right direction when the pandemic started, because if my business had been only in person sales, you know, um, we would have been in trouble. So I think, it, you know, it's allowed for, for us to choose the venues that work when, when we need to. Well, having the, the diversification, the multiple venues, the, um, the flexibility and the versatility is a survival skill as you're, as you're demonstrating. One of the things that you said about 9-11, I remember reading that stock in, of all places, Michael's, the craft supply store, skyrocketed after 9-11 that people were nesting and turning to working with their hands. And there were a lot of articles in the Times about people mm -hmm. turning back to woodworking and so forth. And I think that, uh, I'm not saying there's any silver lining really of 9-11 of or the pandemic, but it's interesting to note that what we artists do all the time to feel satisfied in life is to work with our hands and other people are catching on to that. And yeah. You happen to be really, you have found a niche that is, I think, going to be always present, which is exciting. I'm, I'm just fascinated by uh, the fact that you're doing all this manufacturing uh, in-house and you're an independent businesswoman. Can you speak to some of the struggles that you've had in, in how you're perceived in the world of business and how it's been challenging and how you overcome those challenges, which clearly you're doing? Thank you. Yeah, definitely from the beginning, a struggle that I've had is that people assume that I'm not the business owner. So when I was doing in-person shows, um, when I was doing my first in-person shows, I would bring my dad with me because he is a ham. He loved talking to people and teaching them how to spin and stuff. And so people would assume it was his business or um, people would ask me a lot, like who makes everything? Because they wouldn't assume that as a as a woman, I would be manufacturing in wood on my own. So, and sadly it was mostly older women and I felt sad for them that they didn't assume that they could just make anything that they wanted to. Um, so it was always kind of exciting to tell them, no, I make this, but um, that's definitely been a thing that was, has been a struggle with me. If I have a male employee, people assume that he's the one whose business it is too. So um, that's something that I've had to overcome. And another thing that I've that I struggle with is getting um, copied. <laughs> so, you know, I'm constantly brainstorming and coming up with new things. And there's often people who decide that they should also sell the same thing that I do. So my strategy is to stay ahead of it. But a few years ago, I got knocked off very specifically. And I felt very targeted by this because it was a big box store and they started selling two of my designs that were exact copies. Um, and so I, posted about it on Facebook 
and the post went viral and it had like 80,000 shares or something like that. And um, basically the company ended up contacting me and telling me that intellectual property is something they take very seriously. And they wanted to know, did I really think that they copied them? And I sent them the pictures and I said, yes. And so the way that they decided to handle it was um, they said that they would sell through the stock that they had, but that they weren't going to pull it from the stores, but they just wouldn't reorder it. So I decided that since they weren't going to pull their stock, I wasn't going to take my post down that, you know, pointed out that they knocked me off. So I felt like that was as much of a win as I was going to get. So I took it, but I also learned from it that I needed to trademark my name and get some copyrights. So I have been, I have, a, I have the copy, the trademark and I'm in the process of getting some copyrights too. So, um, hmm. so that's definitely something that I struggle with all the time, but really staying ahead of it. And um, because Katrinkles is so well known, a lot of times when people knock me off, um, I get sent pictures of it from my fans, which is really great because it helps me know when it's happened. But I think also people assume that things are made by Katrinkles, which is, is kind of fun because <laughs> well, they can just tell that our quality and our wood is made here. It's, it's increasing your bandwidth, but maybe in ways that you don't care for if it's not the same quality. Um, are you yeah. protected? Are, can you, I mean, can you, this is a, an incredible story of advocacy and now you can add being a legalista to your <laughs> skills, but um, do things like patents or I guess you said copyrights protect you when this happens? Yeah, so I have some copyrights. Basically a, um, a patent, you need to have a mechanism to, to patent and patenting is a lot more expensive than copywriting so what I've been doing is copywriting and really any type of um, protection that you do on intellectual property it's really it's only as powerful as um, the amount of power it has is only as good as how well you're willing to stand up to it so basically like if I have a copyright but I don't actually go after anyone who copies me, then it's not really worth anything. So I have to stay on top of it by, you know, every once in a while looking and making sure that nobody's stuff is getting too close. And when it does, I contact them and ask them to please stop or I'll get my lawyer involved. And I've only had to get my lawyer involved a couple of times. So, um, but yeah, every time I talk about it, I start getting a little like nervous about it and realizing I need to go check again because it's been a little while. You need a watchdog to add to your staff, but <laughs> I have a question in the, in the Q and A that's come in, which is, uh, I'll, I'll read it because it's so nicely written. It's so impressive that you have created this business from the ground up and um, wore all of the various, it's, I think the person means that you do all the various jobs necessary unless that's a typo. Now that you have employees, what percentage of your day do you spend on designing? Um, that's a great question. So I probably spend half of my time designing and then the other half running the business. Um, and the running of the business is not my favorite part of it. So I keep trying to hand those parts off to other people. But um, but the designing part is kind of like the, the icing, you know, it's like my reward for, for things. But sometimes the running of the business part takes less thought like it you know it's less difficult so sometimes I let that part take over because sometimes you have days where you feel more creative than others and other days where you'd rather answer emails and that kind of stuff so it kind of balances out right. but it's because I started the business by myself and because I started as a hobby I have done every part of everything that we have going on here so um so it really feels like such a luxury to not have to do all the parts I don't like to do anymore. <laughs> but I would love to be able to spend all of my time designing. Actually, when I say the business part of it, I think that also includes marketing. Mm -hmm. I'm still creating, you know, the catalog for wholesale and um, the banners for the website and that kind of stuff. But I think at some point, I'll probably pass that off to somebody else who could spend more time on that's certainly part of uh, being a creative person. I mean, you are, you use the word just now, creative marketing. I mean, you are creating the look and the aesthetic and the message. Um, I really enjoy that part of it. And I love the, like the stats of it, like seeing what sold and how many of this sold and what part of the year it sold during. And I love looking at like the reports of, of products or like seeing what my 
what my newsletter, you know, how my newsletter affected people, what people clicked on. I think that kind of stuff is really fascinating. And I, I enjoy that part, even though that's not at all what I went to school for. Well, but uh, tracking that is really important because you can sort of keep track of trends. Do you ever mm -hmm. retire any of your designs? Or are you too young? Is your do I ever what? Retire any of your designs or do you? Keep oh, I actually, yeah, I have been doing that. Um, I, I've realized because we're, we're going to start tracking inventory soon, which I've never done before. So we are just about to retire a bunch of things um, because I want to have less SKUs basically. <laughs> So, but it's kind of fun to be able to do that, you know, because now I have stats. My old website didn't keep stats, but my new website does. So now I can see exactly what sold. Um, and it really helps me realize like, oh, okay, we shouldn't really be sell selling this anymore because people aren't buying it. So right. it's, Big decision. it's really fun to see that. Mm -hmm. um, and I've also realized a, a way that I've pivoted, I guess, to use that word that everyone uses about the pandemic. Um, I used to do a wholesale trade show that got canceled. So the way that my business worked before was that every year for the wholesale trade show, I would launch all my new products then and stores would come through the booth and buy them, but the show got canceled. So I decided what to do instead is launch new products sort of consistently, like every month or every couple months launch something new and do special collections. Um, and something else that's really important to me as a business owner, which I didn't mention yet, is that I want to give back. So because my business does well, I run a fundraiser every month for something. So this month, our fundraiser, I don't actually have one in front of me, but we, I designed these little vaccinated COVID-19 oh. vaccinated pins. Oh. Um, and we, on the website, I have it set up so that you can either get one for free just for the cost of shipping if you want to um, through the end of April. Or you can purchase one, but we're donating the entire purchase price to the um, the World Health Organization's COVID nineteen um, COVID nineteen action fund. I think it's called. Um, it's linked on my website. But so far, we've raised over six thousand oh, dollars. So nice. I'm going to be sending that to. I mean, I think by the end of this month, it will be over that too. So it's it feels really amazing to be able to run fundraisers or like that and give things back. And uh -huh. I started doing that quarterly but it it feels so good to do it that i actually started doing it monthly instead beautiful a, a smart businesswoman an artist and a social conscious as well <laughs> incredible um there's another way that i just discovered that you're building community and, and being incredibly generous and and paying forward in my opinion which is i just read about your little free craft library in your name <laughs> We've all seen these uh, local communities having the boxes that look like little buildings in various neighborhoods where people can feel free to take a book or leave a book. During COVID, a lot of people were putting food and turning those into food pantries for people who were starving during the <laughs> pandemic, people who were homeless, who needed things to eat. But yours recently in your neighborhood has been about providing craft supplies why don't you talk a little bit about it in one of these little I think you actually built the little box too right I did it but I built I bought the box okay. again you know I was like someone else is going to do a better job of building this than I am so I I purchased the box from actually littlefreelibrary.org they make them oh, and sell them with the post and they have a few different styles so I I bought a little one because I want people I want to encourage people to make things you know people in my neighborhood I live in Elmhurst and people walk a lot and walk their dogs or walk their kids to school. Um, and I just think it's so fun to walk past the, the book library in my neighborhood and which, as you said, currently has food in it. Um, and I was thinking like, I wanna encourage people to make things too. So I went through all the things that I own that I think people might wanna make stuff with. I, I think as a lot of creative people, I have more supplies than I'll be able to get through in my lifetime. So I went through and I pulled out some things and some, made some kits and I purchased some things and I have kind of an extra stock of what I plan to put in there, but it just went up over the weekend and uh, already people noticed it and they've been posting about it on the, my neighborhood Facebook group and on my neighborhood buy nothing group and people have been adding to it, which is so fun. I don't know exactly yet if anyone's taken anything from it. It's hard to tell. <laughs> I have to get better about documenting so I can figure out what's missing, but I made a little guest book and in the guest book, I encourage people to leave a doodle and people are leaving doodles. So it has an Instagram, which is um, little free craft library. 
Right, no punctuation, little free craft library. It's a wonderful thing. I plan to follow it. I am following it to see what mm -hmm. happens. I want to see what people make. I mean, it's it's a food pantry for the soul. I mean, you're yeah, I hope people tag me in the things that they make. There's some really good stuff in there right now. Somebody over the weekend dropped off all these really cute kits. Um, somebody made these little bat like cloth bags, and there's all these um, patches that you can stick onto the bags for a little project bag. And there's a little unicorn weaving kit and I have crayons in there and crochet supplies. I'm trying not to make it too yarn heavy, even though that's what I'm interested in. But um, I think it will be really cool to see how it progresses as it sits out there. That's a wonderful interactive component of what you're doing. Not that the rest of it isn't interactive because it sounds like you've got a lot of fans. We just got a question pop in in the Q&A, which is from an anonymous attendee, very mysterious. <laughs> How did you come up with the name for your business? Um, when I was a kid, my mom would call me Katrinkles kind of as a joke. Um, and then when I was in high school, one of my really good friends, he's still one of my good friends. He worked with me at McDonald's um, and he heard my mom call me Katrinkles. And then he started exclusively calling me Katrinkles at work, you know, burger up for Katrinkles. So um, I just started using the word Katrinkles for stuff because it was a funny name that no one else uses. Um, and that's just how I started the business. So when I first started Katrinkles, I was selling stuff at the Coggeshell Fiber Festival and it wasn't even laser cut stuff. It was just, it was actually buttons that I was drilling holes into that were quahog shells. Um, and I just called that Katrinkles cause it was like what I was called stuff. Um, and at first it kind of embarrassed me when people would say like, oh, it's Katrinkles or like, look, this stuff is Katrinkles. And I would I would kind of cringe because, you know, it was a nickname that my mom called me, but actually I'm so thankful that I called it Katrinkles because I feel like it's such a whimsical, unique name that it really, the, it has really been the perfect name for the business. Um, yeah, the combination. Unfortunately, someone else has the name Katrinkles on Instagram. Oh, no. And so people tag her all the time. It must be so annoying because she's not a knitter. Um, so my Instagram is actually Katrinkles knitting jewelry with underscores because I can't get the name Katrinkles. I've offered to buy it. I feel like she would want me to buy it because she I would think so. so annoyed with how often she's tagged. But so I'm not the only Katrinkles, I guess there's another one. <laughs> well, maybe you can run her out of town in a friendly way. Um, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's such an appealing, not knowing the family history to the story, I just associated it with Katie and Trinkets because I like Yeah, it. I thought it just was a perfect name from that. Um, I want to invite those in attendance to keep those questions coming. We have about 10 more minutes before we say goodbye. One just came in and I'm going to keep watch. Uh, let's see. What a great idea. Love that. We have a business similar to that in Kansas City called Scraps KC. It benefits the homeless. They are employed there. Funds are given to them for food and clothing. All sorts of craft art supplies are donated and anyone can visit and purchase at thrift store prices. This is beautiful. That's we're, awesome. We're really helping people. I mean, it's definitely, we know that the serotonin levels in the brain are <laughs> increased when we make things, right? It's now we have science supporting our habits, our creative mm -hmm. habits. So the fact that you're providing these materials for people, in addition to the market that you're covering, it's just a beautiful thing. So any more questions? I'm just going to take a look here. We got the name, we got that. So if you had uh, a sabbatical, it's not gonna happen, I know you're, <laughs> but if you had three months where you could do whatever you wanted to do, what would it be? I'm talking now about creative activity. I don't mean like lie on a beach. I mean, you can tell me that if you want, but I was thinking that you do so many different things with your hands and you make things and you knit and you fix and you paint and you, I mean, what would you do if you had a sabbatical to make art? I do really love to go to the beach. I think um, if I was, I mean, I also really love to travel and I think the pandemic has given me this itch to like go somewhere. Um, but I, in January, I rediscovered my love for watercolor painting and I have been obsessively watercoloring as well as knitting and sewing. Um, the pandemic has really given me a lot of time to sew my own wardrobe and mend my own wardrobe. So um, I think I, in that sabbatical, I would do those same things, but while traveling. So one of the things that I have been stocking up on recently are travel water so color supplies. I have like this little tiny palette and these travel brushes, which is so funny because I'm not going anywhere, but I'm ready to go. So I think I would, um, 
I had to cancel my honeymoon because of the pandemic. So I think I would go on that and just like travel all over Europe and maybe even just hang out in Maine on an island and paint and knit and maybe start a quilt. But I always joke that whenever I take a day off, I actually get a lot of work done um, because I can't stop myself from working. So as much as I love creating and crafting, I probably on that sabbatical, but also be working because I just can't help myself. Well, the word work becomes, <laughs> becomes kind of fluid. I mean, many people think of that as a negative word, as a bad word. And like, if only I didn't have to work, but you're, you're working all the time. And, and, when, and what you see that inspires the line is certainly part of the process, as part of the creation. Something that I've really realized recently is how much inspiration I get from traveling and from being places like going to museums and going to antique stores and just in general, being out in the world, sitting in a, ca a cafe and people watching. And that is something that I've really been lacking in the past year, as I think most people have. So even when I'm just driving my car for 20 minutes, which I hardly ever do at this point, I, all these things come to me, like in my subconscious, all these ideas. And, um, so it's going to be really exciting to be able to get out in the world again, because I think it will really fuel creativity that I have not, I've, I haven't been paying attention to because I have been working from my dining room table a lot of the time. It has been somewhat of an arid time. We got a great question. I think a potential customer here who wants to know, do you sell any of the clothes that you make? Is there a way to buy that rainbow scarf that's behind you? It is so cool. <laughs> I don't. Um, I really love other people making things for themselves. And, you know, rather than me making something for you, I love showing people how to do it so that they can learn how to do it forever. So um, I did knit that scarf and it's a cool yarn that rainbow yarn changes color. So it's actually two yarns. It's a gray one. And then a, like a kind of a rainbow one that does that on its own. It's called County. And I think it's, I can't remember where it's from. It's Scandinavian, I think. K-A-U-N-I. It's really neat. If you look that up, all the amazing color work that people have done with it because the colors change on their own. Um, I, hope that that, I hope that that answer um, satisfied the appetite <laughs> and the longings of, right. that, of that. <laughs> the, um, I guess people can communicate with you on your website if they have questions. Many people are thanking you right now as we're getting close to the end. Somebody's saying thank you for sharing your story and showing us your studio. Very inspiring, exciting. People are going to be following you now. So you have thank some you. new fans that are writing a flurry of messages here at the end saying how great this was. This was Thanks. a really intimate opportunity to see this, this studio. I'm sure it's usually bustling. So it's kind of like getting the chef's tour behind the scenes, which is very exciting. Yeah, it's really quiet in here right now. And during the day, um, I, since I've started coming back to the office recently, I realized how much I love being here and listening to you know people making things and people talking to each other and just the general I mean, it's kind of noisy in here. The machines themselves are pretty noisy. Um, and a lot of people are wearing just their headphones all the time because they're really in the zone of what they're doing and they're pretty spread far apart. But it's really cool being in an environment where people are making stuff. So I try to post a lot of pictures of that in the process on my Instagram to show people, you know, that we really do make everything here and that we're mostly women doing that. So I think it's kind of, it's a cool space to be in and I'm really happy that I have created it. It sounds like art school, only <laughs> you just said that there's mainly women making this stuff. I mean, I was really, um, I just felt upset hearing what you said and it happens to us so many times when someone assumes that somebody else who's a man is, is running the business or cutting the wood and you're, you're kind of the front woman for it. Um, what about this idea of uh, celebrating the tradition that uh, Miriam Shapiro, the painter, used to call it women's work, <clears throat> that the idea that knitting and fibers are traditionally, there's a history of it being considered women's work, and the idea of elevating it to the status of art uh, was a challenge for many women for many years. But the fact that you are such a strong businesswoman and have so much integrity in terms of your, your company and your product helps us, helps the image, I think, tremendously. Um, but that I was going to ask you about, the, about your staff. Do you come across men who are knitters? Um, yeah, I do. Actually, one of my really good friends is a, a male knitter. Um, I, I knit with Providence Stitch and Bitch and he's the one who, he, he didn't start it, I don't think, but he's the one who kind of organizes it now. Um, 
and yeah, there are definitely other male knitters too. Um, but yeah, it's really, I think, cool to be a woman who runs heavy machinery. And I, mm-hmm. I would say we were all, we are all women, but my, um, my unofficial, like my unrelated brother-in-law in November started working for me to help me out for two weeks on a project. And he's still here because we have just never been able to let go of him. So we have one man right now, but everyone else is a woman. When I was uh, I living in a different city and teaching crafts, I used to recruit football players to the crafts classes. Um, and they got tremendous relaxation. And it was like a stress buster once they got over the fact that they were guys in the in this <laughs> space. And it was quite a moving experience to see them slowly relax into it. So we'll have to recruit some men for Katrinkles. <laughs> uh, Katie, I, want- I, I really like having a, an, a female team, but I'm not like, I'm not saying that I would never hire a guy. <laughs> okay, you heard it here first, guys. If there's anybody... <laughs> Um, Katie, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. When I met you um, at one of our RISD alumni club events, I immediately took a liking to you and was really inspired by hearing more about your business just in that casual uh, format. And this has just been an amazing opportunity for everybody here. So I just want to thank you so much for your time. And I hope everybody knows um, now how to follow you and how to watch your your career. I can't wait to see what you make next. Um, I want to repeat the fact that being an alumni volunteer is a great gift to others as well as to oneself. And it's been a great experience for me. This coincidentally is my last um, event because I have stepped down as the chair of the Rhode Island club chapter and I'm moving on to other leadership opportunities at RISD to be announced later. But I've had a wonderful, wonderful experience in this club work and I want to encourage those that are listening to reach out through the alumni portal. And uh, if you have suggestions for programs, we're always interested to hear those. And this was just a perfect, a perfect evening. So thanks to everybody. Thanks for your great questions. And Katie, see you in the hood. Thank you so much. It's been really fun chatting with you. See you again. Bye. Thank you.